So I'm glad to introduce you um, engineer Filippa Makobore. Uh, she's now working at the University of Calgary in uh, Canada. Uh, but uh, I met her and we worked a lot with her when she was head of the instrumentation division at the Uganda Industrial Research Institute. She, has, uh, she was the team leader of the first device, medical device, that was designed and fabricated completely in Uganda. And she has a lot of experience in doing on-field studies. In particular, she has been in four uh, hospitals and identified the needs that need to be uh, solved in order to promote uh, health equity in Uganda. Uh, Filippa is connected. Unfortunately, she was not able to be here for visa restriction and the time to process all the documentation, but she's online. It's, at in, it's 8 in the morning in, uh, in Canada right now, if I understood well. So I leave the floor to, to Filippa. Uh, thank you for the kind presentation, Carmelo. Um, so it's a pleasure to uh, make a presentation at this PhD school. I would have really liked to be um, there. As Carmelo had said, I'm now uh, with the University of Calgary doing my doctoral studies. And I was formerly the department head of the instrumentation division at the Uganda Industrial Research Institute. So um, you already have uh, the book, so I'll just go straight into my slides. Um, the outline of my presentation is as follows. I'm going to discuss the methodologies to identify clinical needs, some of the limitations of devices that we've seen in the hospitals in Uganda and beyond, um, ranking and prioritizing these clinical needs so that you're able to develop um, informative needs-driven innovations, and I'll lastly end with a case study that we did um, in Uganda on uncovering clinical and medical equipment gaps. Um, so to start off with, um, I'm sure you've already read through the chapter, um, but I discussed some qualitative and quantitative approaches to collect data on um, the situation on the ground in health facilities, mostly for low resource settings. So something that you have to be well aware of um, is there's not a lot of literature on uh, specific data. Um, so infectious diseases have prevailed for um, a large period of time. And so there's quite a lot of literature that's out there on infectious diseases, but there might be some niche clinical areas where primary data would not be readily accessed. So usually the collection of primary data is the most reliable, but it has to be very well planned. So one of the ways to do this is to have open-ended questionnaires. So you could collect both qualitative and quantitative data this way. And this is to reduce um, kind of unconscious bias. Um, sometimes in low resource settings, based on the way you structure questionnaires, sometimes clinicians may tend to change their responses that don't really reflect what's actually happening on the ground. So you have to be very careful about that. One-on-one um, -on -one, um, interviews are very effective in collecting a lot of this information. And we found that it's extremely effective for you to observe and document clinicians when they're uninterrupted, because there you can un uncover certain gaps that maybe you've not captured in some of those one-to-one -one interviews. Um, another way you can collect some of the um, pain points in clinical care is observation of the patients and documenting some of their experiences as they're receiving care. Obviously, if you're to interact with patients and to collect data from them, um, you may need ethical approval. So that's something that you have to be well aware of. In the clinical setting, um, lots of clinicians um, put patients at the center of care and their rights um, and health outcomes have to be protected. So you have to be aware of that, especially as an engineer. So we do have medical devices in low resource settings, but what is the challenge? So we have a lot of donated equipment. Almost 70% of the equipment is donated. There are some larger pieces of equipment, obviously, that would be very difficult to innovate around, such as MRI, 
MRI, MRI scanners and the like. Um, but there have been some efforts uh, to develop low cost um, MRIs. But um, for the most part, even the smaller devices, for example, autoclaves, infusion pumps, um, uh, pneumonia diagnostic kits, um, all these are donated. And the challenge with this, as much as they're well-meaning, is they don't come with the requisite man manuals. Clinicians are not properly trained on the equipment and biomedical technicians don't have access to spare parts. And why is this? A lot of donated equipment is usually at the end of life um, for a lot um, of the Western countries. And so these are sent to low source countries because they have no use and most hospitals are decommissioning this equipment. The challenge with that though, is that you do not have direct access to manufacturers um, for spare parts or technical support. So this results in them being um, uh, remaining broken, um, non-functional when they actually um, do break down. So you have instances such as what you see in the pictures, a graveyard of a lot of uh, medical equipment um, that cannot be repaired and put back into the hospitals. So one of the ways in which we can rank and prioritize clinical needs um, is to look at a, a list of um, factors. So this is not an exhaustive list that I've included, but um, this is just to give you a snapshot of where you can start. So first of all, you need to look at you know, the disease burden. Um, you need to look at that uh, particular um, disease case. Let's say, for example, if you're looking at infectious diseases and um, maybe some of those opportunistic uh, diseases um, around infectious diseases, let's say HIV-infected patients. Um, you want to look at the entire um, cycle of care that a patient goes through when they enter the health facility. So we have a tiered health facility uh, structure. So we have a national referral hospital, which would have all the requisite infrastructure for all these cases, and that um, slowly is tapered down to a health center three, which would just have maybe the very basic triage um, tools for you to more or less um, refer a patient to some of those higher um, hospitals, which have more infrastructure. So that's just a, an example. So the disease uh, burden is one of the areas. And then also um, some of the alternatives to exist, the existing standard of care. Um, so let's say, for example, we need to assess um, what do they actually do to diagnose pneumonia? Um, are they looking at you know, respiratory rate? Um, how is that actually being measured? You know, where are the gaps there? Um, is there potential to innovate? And even when we want to innovate, um, what does it look like if we were to develop a tool in that particular area? So um, do we have access to power supply? Do we have access to clean water? So these are all several considerations that we need to think about. So you can assign a ranking for each of these factors using um, a five-point uh, Likert scale, just to make it uh, simplified. And then you just combine these values so that you have an overall score that you're able to rank some of these needs. So you'll keep doing this on an iterative basis till you have a smaller set um, of priority needs. And then finally, once you've gone through a couple of cycles, then you can engage with clinicians and key stakeholders. So in Uganda, we worked closely um, with people in the Ministry of Health and a lot of clinicians, um, especially those providing clinical health care, as well as uh, public health. Uh, practitioners. So we want to be able to validate that these are sound choices and the need is great enough for us to innovate around. So why do we do clinical needs assessments? What's the point? So we need to really understand uh, what the importance is. So first of all, you want to be able to get to the root cause of some of these most pressing healthcare challenges. And you want to be able to also assess um, the landscape in terms of existing tools for diagnosis, for therapy, um, and then also you want to be able to consider challenges from the perspective of the end user. So engineers are very quick to design something that is maybe heavy in terms of functionality, um, but sometimes we don't think about the end user. So we have to kind of reset our mindset 
and think about the entire process from when a patient gets to the hospital all the way to um, when they actually um, receive treatment and uh, you're able to monitor uh, their health outcomes. So um, you also need to assess um, uh, the desired functionality. So once you do, you have developed a prototype, it's good to go back into the hospital and get feedback from clinicians so that you can validate some of your ideas and make improvements so that it can actually be sustained in that environment. So I strongly believe in the design philosophy of designing with instead of designing for. So I'll go into the needs assessment that we did in Uganda. So the study objective was mostly to um, establish more or less a baseline of clinical and medical equipment priorities. And this was more or less laying the platform for us to develop needs-driven medical technologies. Um, so what were some of the challenges that we had? Um, so the lack of regular assessments um, by the Uganda National Framework um, and Policy Regulation for medical devices um, was a, a very big challenge um, because we didn't have um, a lot of information on what that looked like and how devices could actually be translated into critical care. So the healthcare system was also extremely complex. Um, it's not, sometimes it's not enough to develop a new device and put it into a system that is broken. So sometimes you need to think about, you know, systems around, let's say, for example, a new product. You know, how will your device be sustained? What tools can you create in addition to that new product that can help you sustain that particular device? So we used to think around um, a maintenance and calibration system. Um, for example, making it easy for biomedical technicians to access um, technical support for that particular product, and then using modular design so that it's, it's easy for biomedical technicians on site to troubleshoot and identify where the issues are on the device. And once that is beyond what they can, beyond their capacity, then that can be further escalated to the manufacturer. And then from the user's perspective, um, do they have the tools to use the device? Have you designed a user interface that is simple enough for them to use? Is it too feature heavy? You know, so you have to think about some of those things. Um, one of the solutions would be to create posters. So you have graphical posters that can be created and with explanations in different languages um, and also a manual that can be referred to from time to time. So one thing to note is we have very high clinician turnover in low resource settings. So you have to have a device that is very easy to understand from one person to the next. Then with the limited information on the ground in terms of the status of medical equipment in Uganda and East Africa, which I've already discussed, um, was definitely, definitely an obstacle. So the needs assessment um, was done actually um, in several hospitals. So we had about uh, roughly seven to eight hospitals that we're looking at. So as I'd mentioned earlier, we have a tiered healthcare system. So we have our national referral hospital, Mulago, which is based in Kampala, which is the capital city of Uganda. And that's more or less um, the go-to place once you have gone through all the stages of the other health centers. So you'd have, let's say, an health center three, which is really in, in the community which would have basic triage. Um, maybe they might only have nurses on site. Then you go to a health center or there you may find a general physician who would be able to assess you. And then you'd move on to like a regional referral hospital and then subsequently to the national referral hospital. Um, so we looked at a couple of um, health facilities in the Eastern, Central and Western Uganda and we were examining um, challenges in pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, in the intensive care unit, um, emergency surgery, as well as um, the laboratories. So we were able to understand what some of the most critical healthcare challenges were, um, also assess um, some of the limitations with a lot of the devices that were available. That's when we did find devices and then also um, establish some of the reasons for the lack of ineffectiveness of these particular devices. 
Um, so in terms of the methods that we used, um, so we used interviews, so direct, both direct and indirect. Um, we observed several clinicians, we visited the biomedical technician workshops, um, we assessed um, the capacity for those particular workshops to maintain the equipment, and we used various data collection tools. So we developed questionnaires, um, and we had uh, several inventories and repositories that were already existing um, from the Ministry of Health that collected some of this data. So that was also extremely helpful. So basically, um, what we did was assessing the standard of care, clinical ass assessing those clinical needs, the devices that were available, and uh, the challenges faced with existing um, tools. So I'll just uh, quickly go through some of the results. This is already in your chapter, but just um, kind of to go through it. Um, so we found that the greatest burden was with vulnerable populations, so pediatrics and maternal health, um, as you can see from this uh, pie chart. And then next, um, we're looking at outpatient um, issues. So that was more or less general across uh, several um, different uh, disease states. And then um, casualty um, as well as uh, surgery were the ones uh, that were more or less uh, the last. However, we did notice that um, there were very large clinics, uh, let's say, for example, for HIV, and the outcomes seemed to uh, be fairly effective in trying to uh, diagnose patients and then also to put them on treatment, so usually on anti antiretroviral uh, medication. So we found that a lot of those um, very targeted efforts had kind of improved a lot of the outcomes, especially for infectious diseases. But unfortunately, um, pediatrics and maternal health is still suffering quite a bit. When we looked at the equipment that was available, um, we found that um, the lack of equipment was a very huge challenge. Um, there were several staff constraints. We found biomedical technician workshops of about four to five um, personnel that were more or less catering and servicing um, almost 100 hospitals, which, which seemed very difficult to understand because, um, yeah, that's a very huge uh, ratio and a very big gap. Um, so we feel that um, even when we're creating new innovations, we really need to empower the, the end users, so the clinicians, because from what we saw on the ground, the biomedical technicians are very few and they have um, limited capacity in terms of accessing spare parts and uh, maintaining uh, this equipment for a very large number of hospitals. Um, other issues were also uh, procurement constraints, so that's accessing spare parts. Um, some financial constraints also related to, you know, budgetary considerations for tools, for calibration and maintenance. So those were there, but um, limited in terms of availability. Um, and then also in terms of adverse events, um, when clinicians are able to report adverse events, they didn't appear to be a very clear structure as to how that reporting actually happened. So that was also a big challenge. So from some of the um, conclusions um, we more or less had were um, we were able to paint a clear picture in three regions of the country in terms of medical device gaps as well as clinical needs. Um, we noticed that the burden of healthcare was greater in maternal and pediatric health. Um, so we had issues to do with you know, neonatal sepsis, uh, malaria, pneumonia, anemia, birth asphyxia, and uh, premature births, as well as postpartum hemorrhage. And one of the things that we noticed was um, patients come too late to the hospitals. So let's say, for example, a patient has malaria, but by the time they come to the hospital, you have a replication of parasites. Um, the, the patient most probably would have to be put on intravenous therapy, and they will most probably even become anemic. They may need blood transfusion. So you can see there's a huge burden on the health facilities because patients do not come early enough to the hospitals to seek care. And for the existing medical devices, they were inadequate 
um, difficult to maintain and most lacked user training, which compromised on the patient safety. So I'll more or less summarize with the role of biomedical engineers and um, our contribution to creating solutions for global health challenges. So we need to be able to understand, you know, what settings we're looking at and what settings we're innovating for and understand some of those design constraints. So I mentioned earlier, access to power supply, um, even in urban areas, in a lot of the low resource countries, you have an unstable power supply. So this can be a big challenge. We need to think of modularity in terms of the design. So how, will, how can we more or less break down our design um, in a functional way so that we're able to easily troubleshoot when it's actually deployed? Then supply chain considerations. So how are we going to source quality parts? We are designing medical devices and at some point we will need to meet regulatory standards. So do we have a reliable supply chain so that we have consumables um, that can continue you know, the efforts in that respect? And then low manufacturing cost. We want to be able to um, mass manufacture a lot of these products. So um, that's also very important. And um, also leveraging local and international collaborations so that you know, we can all share knowledge, um, share information um, as well as experiences. So I'll end with a video um, of a device uh, that we worked on at Uganda Industrial Research Institute. I just hope the audio will be fine. Infusion in young children includes giving them intravenous fluids or giving them blood or giving them medication via an intravenous line. Now the key challenge is many of our infusion sets are manually controlled. So if you are, for example, treating a patient with uh, severe dehydration and you need to give fluid within 30 minutes, you'll have to calculate the number of drops per minute and because this is a manually controlled method, sometimes the fluid, you don't ever know how much is going to get in. Sometimes it's at a tap rate, sometimes it's drops per second, but you require somebody to manually calculate those drops and ensure that the child is getting the correct treatment. <laughs> The idea to design the ECGF was born. electronically controlled gravity feed infusion set was born. And what it does is it automates the entire infusion process from start to the end and provides the minimum safety features for a patient. Yes. So in machine at Yambelomun. We've been able to pre clinically test the device against medical device standards, and it performed at plus or minus 1% as its uh, margin or accuracy, which is the deviation between the actual and the prescribed flow rate. In addition to that, we were also able to carry out our first clinical pilot in adults with infectious diseases, which was conducted at Mulago Hospital at Chirudu. 
and we were able to attain an error margin of plus or minus 7%. After that, we designed a study for the pediatric population, which was conducted at Fort Porter Regional Referral Hospital, as well as in Barara Regional Referral Hospital. After that study, we hope to raise a round of funding, which will enable us to complete a phase two trial, and in parallel also initiate the process to start CE marking the device. We all know that priority is given to patients as opposed to the technology. So as such, uh, there are so many regulatory authorities that are put in place to ensure that uh, the device is safe for use um, in our patients. So we had to seek approvals. We got approval from the Makere University School of Medicine Research and Ethics Committee. Uh, we also got approvals, ethical approval from Uganda National Council of uh, Science and Technology. Uh, from Ministry of Health and also final clearance from the National Drug Authority. We also carried out a children's pilot at Ambara um, Regional Referral Hospital and Fort Porto Regional Referral Hospital in uh, children ages uh, 5 to, to, to 8 years. Uh, there were a total of 24 children, 12 on the control arm, 12 on the intervention. Uh, uh, when we got the results and analyzed them, they were submitted to the Data Safety Management Board, DSMB, who uh, uh, upon satisfaction, uh, they uh, recommended for us to continue with the transition into the actual children pilot. The children pilot was carried out in children two aged two months to five years, in a total of uh, 136 children, 68 still on the control arm, and then 68 on the intervention. We thought this machine was too complicated but as time went on, I w I w we got used with it, and we s think it would be very helpful in monitoring our children. The user interface of the ACDS device was designed in such a manner as to be very user-friendly. It was also designed in such a manner that the device is operated in a very safe manner, uh, seeing as a, it's a medical device and uh, safety is such a crucial concern when it comes to medical devices. For instance, uh, uh, when the clinician keys in, say, um, the amount of drug or the duration in which the drug should be administered, uh, there's a prompt for them to confirm that amount as well as the duration uh, so that uh, what they actually intended to administer is actually what is, is administered. Ni ntekeresa machine yenu ne yango kukozesebu kakubo mtu bo mase kukimanyiri. Hanyuma ne yamba no, no kumonitaringa amaisi kuku amaisi kukugena mumbiru guo mwana ni gamara mkaireki kikuwe taki sana kukwikara kukarolera liyu no gena no korabi yawe kukua amaisi ni getuara. Haka sumi ya mkakuika etioma ni kukambira mkati uvira wahefu. improved on performance, on usability, and as well as safety. Um, in terms of uh, performance, we have made uh, changes in terms of volume compensation. So we are now guaranteeing um, a volume as well as the drop rate that was pre in the previous version. So we have designed algorithm to be able to cater for factors that actually change the volume of a drop and in so doing, um, improving on the performance uh, of and the accuracy that we attain at the end of the therapy. In terms of usability, we did realize that if an adverse effect happened, the clinicians needed to record the value that they need to input for the next therapy to happen. However, for this version 1.2, we're provided for a resume function so that the clinicians do not need to remember what value they need to input for the therapy to continue. Uh, we have also provided for them an option to terminate in case uh, they need to terminate the therapy. We have provided for safety measures as well uh, in terms of uh, detection of air bubble within the tube. So we provided sensors to be able to do that. And um, if 
an air bubble is detected within uh, the tube, the therapy is terminated, and a clinician is also provided for means to be able to flush the air bubble from the tube and resume as need be.